I tell you, I've been blessed these last few days that I've been traveling to Southern California. You live in paradise. <laughs> now, there are few demons in this paradise, but we're going to pray them out. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. America is still a Christian nation, Amen. regardless of what they tell us. Amen. So praise God. So I want to challenge you tonight. I want to let you know this. I have been told that I have a ministry of stepping on toes. <laughs> so if I step on your toes, just say, ouch. <laughs> and do something about it. <clears throat> so, I tell you, as Pastor Harold was talking about my coming to America, because I know what it is to live in bondage. I love this country with a passion. I love this country with a passion. I, I must have told my son, you know, Ted, when I left my country in search of freedom, when I lost my freedom in Cuba, I had a place to come to. If we lose our freedoms here, where are we going to go? We need to think soberly about that because there ain't no place to go. This is it. And I'll tell you what, we are fighting for our children and our children's children. You know, one of my favorite Californians, a man that I spent a year campaigning for and mobilizing Christians all across America to help electing president, Ronald Reagan. And I love that man. And Ronald Reagan once said, freedom is not free. Freedom is not passed from generation to generation in our bloodstream. Every generation has to fight to protect it and preserve it. Or we may find ourselves in our later years talking to our children and our children's children about what it was like when men were free in America. I don't know about you, I'm not willing to have that conversation. Amen. So I want to tell you, we are not just fighting for our lives. We are fighting for the future of our children and our grandchildren. How old are you? She's 12. We're fighting for your future. Yes. Yes. And let me tell you something very sobering. If we lose this battle, you will not have a future. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is how important this is. There is no time for being a bench warmer. We are in a spiritual battle for the future of America and for the future of our children and our children's children. I want to tell you about the greatness of America. America is so very unique. Do you realize that America is the only country on the face of the earth founded as a Christian nation? You know, when those pilgrims came to America and they landed in Plymouth, Massachusetts, before they got off the boat, they penned a document it was called the Mayflower Compact, and it begins by stating their purpose for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That was their stated purpose. It continues, in the presence of God, we covenant and combine ourselves together to form a civic body politic. In other words, some form of government. Why? 
for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. What are the ends aforesaid? The glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. What a glorious heritage. But you know, even those very committed Christian men and women, their first year in Plymouth Plantation, they decided to try a communist experiment. They said, look, we got all this land before us. Why don't we work the land together and let us share equally in what the land produces? Sounds very romantic, doesn't it? Well, that experiment was a total failure. And I'll tell you why it was a total failure. Because, you know, this man over here looks pretty strong. He could probably plow 10, 12 hours a day. But I wasn't so strong. Maybe I could plow only two hours a day. How long do you think he was going to plow 12 hours a day while I plow two and we're going to get the same? Probably not more than a week. And then he'll say, I ain't doing any more than that guy over there. So nobody worked. They almost starved to death. As a matter of fact, half of them died that first year. But they were smart enough and flexible enough that they came before Governor Bradford. And they said, Governor, this didn't work. So Governor Bradford said, all right, each of you take your own plot of land, you work the land, you feed your family. And the free enterprise system was born in America the first year of our existence. Now, let me ask you something. If we tried it 400 years ago and it didn't work, why would we be dumb enough to try it again? Why do we have all those dumb people in Sacramento trying to do it again? Why do we have all these professors across the universities in America trying to brainwash our kids into doing it again? I mean, just look at Venezuela. Country with incredible oil reserves. Do you know that in Venezuela, people are going through garbage cans to find something to eat? Communism doesn't work. And you know why it doesn't work? Because it's contrary to the Word of God. If there is one message in the Word of God about individual responsibility. See, communism, socialism destroys individual responsibilities. It's all about something called collectivism, the rights of the group. And it's very insidious. They divide everybody into a series of groups. They pit one group against another, and they make every group seem like victims that need a handout from government. Now, now let me tell you the worst part about a handout. First of all, a handout never gets anybody out of poverty. It preserves them in poverty. But the second is thing is this. It kills the dream. It kills the dream. You become complacent and happy with mediocrity. Proverbs 29, 18 says, without a vision, people perish. God gives us a vision. And with that vision comes a passion to do the very best. Colossians 3.17 and Colossians 3.23 tells us what should be our attitude. It says to do everything with excellence as unto the Lord and not unto men. We are destined for excellence, not for mediocrity. And it begins by understanding who we are. But anyway, let me tell you a little bit about that early American history. See, most of us were told in school that the American Revolution started in the 1770s. But that's not true. 
The American Revolution really started in the 1730s with men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, and a little later on with a black pastor, a black evangelist from Indiana by the name of Harry Hoosier, greatest evangelist in America, called the greatest orator in America. I bet you the people in Indiana don't even know that when they call their basketball team the Hoosiers. <laughs> and Harry Hoosier was a great man of God, great evangelist. These were the people that forged America. As a matter of fact, it was the first great awakening that ignited the spark for the American Revolution. But I'll tell you something that will shock you. Had it not being for pastors, we may still be a colony of Great Britain because the revolution was forged in the churches. You look at the Declaration of Independence. I count 19 grievances against King George in the Declaration of Independence. But did you know that each and every one of those grievances were preached from the pulpits of America for 10 years, 10 years before Jefferson wrote them in the Declaration. It was pastors from the pulpit calling out King George for the atrocities that the British were perpetrating upon the American people. Harold, where are those pastors today? The great majority of them are hiding behind their pulpits, scared to death of not being politically correct. Well, it's about time we become biblically correct instead of politically correct. You remember Paul Revere? The British are coming. The British are coming. First of all, did you know that there was also a black patriot riding with him. His name was Wentworth Cheswell. Wentworth Cheswell was the first African American to occupy public office and occupied nine different posts in the federal government before the year of 1800. And they were going somewhere. They were going to the home of a pastor that pastor was called Jonas Clark. As a matter of fact, at the home of Jonas Clark were two patriots hiding, John Hancock and Samuel Adams. They were being searched by the British to hang them for sedition. Do you remember what was the first battle for our revolution? Anybody remember? Battle? No, Lexington. Lexington, the Battle of Lexington. But did you know that the Battle of Lexington was fought right outside the church of Pastor Jonas Clark? As a matter of fact, at the Battle of Concord, eight colonies died. Seven of those eight were members of Pastor Jonas Clark's church because the pastor and all the men of the congregation were the forefront of that battle. Second battle for our independence, the Battle of Concord, fought right outside the church at Concord. And then the British began to retreat northward towards Boston. And history tells you that militias were coming to the road and engaging the British, and they killed about 600 British soldiers on the way back to Boston. But what history doesn't tell you is that those militias were primarily composed of pastors and their congregation. When you have time, research the Battle of Bunker Hill and try to find out how many pastors were involved in the Battle of Bunker Hill. You see, that is where the revolution was being forged. Let me tell you about my favorite pastor. His name was John Peter Muhlenberg. 
Pastor Muhlenberg was a Lutheran pastor in Woodstock, Virginia. He was one of many pastors that the British greatly feared. They called them the Black Robe Regiment because all these pastors wore long black robes. So Pastor Muhlenberg is preaching at his church in Woodstock, Virginia in early 1776. And he's preaching on Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He concludes his message with verse 8 that says, there's a time for war and a time for peace. He pulls a musket from behind the pulpit and he says, this is a time for war. He opens his black robe and as he opens it, it uncovers his colonel's uniform in the Continental Army. He looks at his congregation and he says, how many of you men will follow me to go fight for our independence? 300 men join pastor, Colonel John Peter Muhlenberg to fight for our independence. Pastor Muhlenberg ended up being a general in the adjunct staff to George Washington. Meanwhile, Pastor Peter Muhlenberg had a brother, Frederick Muhlenberg. Frederick was a pastor in New York City. And Frederick is writing letters to Peter. You are prostituting the gospel. Separation of church and state. You shouldn't be involved in politics until the British burn Frederick's church. <laughs> and then Frederick said, well, 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 maybe I better get involved. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. How many of you saw the movie The Patriot? You remember the British burning a church? Well, the British burned many churches. You know why? Because the revolution was being forged in the churches. In the churches. Let me tell you an interesting caveat. Frederick Muhlenberg was the first speaker of the house. And his brother Peter was also a congressman in that first congress. And the two of them were the driving force before the, before the passing of the First Amendment of the Constitution that gives us our religious freedom. I'll tell you, you think about those men that were our framers. They have been so maligned. I mean, you know, you listen to the liberal media, you listen to these liberal professors, and they tell you they were a bunch of secularists. A bunch of deists. And nothing could be further from the truth. And of course, they love to talk about two of them. The ones they call the two most ungodly framers. You know who they are. Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. But I'll tell you what. Nothing could be further from the truth. Let me tell you about two of those two men. First, Thomas Jefferson. Did you know that Thomas Jefferson wrote a complete annotated Bible, Genesis through Revelation? But, also, but something very interesting that most Americans are not aware of. In the third year of Jefferson's vice presidency, Jefferson wrote an order allowing church services to take place in the rotunda of the Capitol, what is called Statuary Hall. Jefferson attended those services every Sunday while he was vice president, and the eight years he was president, he rode his horse from the, Capi from the White House to the Capitol every Sunday to be at those services. Those services lasted for 65 years with as many as 2,000 people in attendance in the capital. So much for separation of church and state. As a matter of fact, 
the only reason they stopped is that those pastors began building their own churches. And they had no more need of it. Let me tell you about the second one. Benjamin Franklin. You know, most people think about Benjamin Franklin, about this crazy guy that didn't have enough sense to get out of the rain and he's out flying a kite in the rain. <laughs> Let me tell you a couple of tidbits about Benjamin Franklin. Did you know that Benjamin Franklin was the first millionaire in America? And uh, Benjamin Franklin was the oldest of the framers. Had it not been for Benjamin Franklin, we would not have a constitution. The Constitutional Convention was going on for about four weeks. And it was falling apart because those delegates were at each other's necks. Maryland wanted their way and New York wanted their way and Rhode Island wanted their, And it was a mess. And it was this so-called deist, Benjamin Franklin, that addresses the president of the convention. None other than George Washington. And he says, sir, how is it that we have not once called upon the father of lights to illuminate our understanding? Or have we forgotten when we first started this, this struggle against Great Britain, how we met in this very chamber praying for his protection? Sir, those prayers were graciously answered. Or do we believe that we no longer need his assistance? Sir, I have lived a long time. And the longer I live, the more assured I am of this truth. That God governs the affairs of men. That's not the statement of a deist. You know, a deist believes that God was involved in creation and then took his hands off and he said, go at it, I'm out of here. That's a deist. But he said, no, no, no. I am convinced that God governs the affairs of men. And then he said, if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire could be built without his aid? As the Holy Scripture tells us, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Then he said, if we proceed to build this without him, we will fare no better than the builders of Babel. He concluded by saying, I beseech you therefore that from now henceforth, before we proceed with our deliberations, we meet in this chamber for prayer, seeking his wisdom and direction. They left the Constitutional Convention under the leadership of Pastor John Witherspoon, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, for prayer and fasting. They came back to the convention in a totally different spirit. In a spirit of harmony, on their knees. Seven weeks later, they gave us the greatest document that has ever been written in history outside of the Bible. The Constitution of the United States of America. I am convinced without a shadow of a doubt that the Constitution of the United States is a divinely inspired document because it was forged on the knees of the framers. The framers were seeking revelation from above and revelation is what they got. There were two main sources for the Constitution. Source number one, the Bible. Source number two, Blackstone's Dictionary of Law. That is the most amazing book in the world. Blackstone's Dictionary of Law, every definition is based on the Bible. That is where the Constitution came from. Our Constitution has lasted for well over 
two centuries, about 230 years. You know what the average lifespan of a constitution around the world is? 17 years. 17 years. We live in a very, very, very unique uh, country. As a matter of fact, people will tell you again, oh, those framers, they were a bunch of deists, a bunch of secularists. Did you know that 33, 33 of the 56 signers of the declaration were seminary graduates? They were theologians. They were men of God. As a matter of fact, I didn't quote the complete discourse from Franklin. The discourse of Franklin has 16 sentences. How many scripture do you think he quoted? 16. Every statement he made was based on a verse of scripture. Because these men knew the scriptures like the palm of their hands. As a matter of fact, let me tell you a couple of other tidbits. Did you know that each and the 13 colonies just had one denomination? Every colony just had one denomination. You know why? Because the colonies were started by pastors and their congregations. Because of that, for example, Rhode Island was Baptist. Pennsylvania was Quaker. Maryland was Catholic, and so on. And as a matter of fact, let me give you an interesting piece of research. Look at the constitution of the first 13 colonies, the first 13 states. And in just about every one of them, you had to be a Bible believer in Jesus Christ in order to run for public office. It was a requirement. You got to be a born again believer in Jesus Christ to run for public office. Boy, we really stray from that a long ways, haven't we? And you know, you hear all these excuses. Well, separation of church and state. Where did that come from? Let me tell you where that come from. When this new republic was formed, all 13 colonies were concerned as to whether this new government was going to impose a state denomination upon everybody, just like their forefathers had fled from 200 years before. I mean, when the pilgrims came, if you were not a member of the Church of England, the Anglican church, you were persecuted, and that's why they got out of there and came to America to have the freedom to worship Almighty God. So all 13 colonies were concerned. The Danbury Baptist from Rhode Island wrote a letter to then President Thomas Jefferson expressing this concern, but it was the concern of all 13 colonies. So Jefferson writes a letter back to appease their fears. And he begins by saying, believing with you that in matters of faith and religion, those are only between man and his God, that no one has the right to interfere. And then he says that their legislation shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In other words, he quotes verbatim the First Amendment of the Constitution. And then he says, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Now let's take, if you take those three statements in context, it is absolutely obvious that Jefferson is talking about a one-way wall. A one-way wall to prevent government from imposing a state religion upon we the people. A one-way wall to prevent government from interfering with our free exercise of religion. There's no way that you could infer that Jefferson was saying 
that we as the church should not be involved in every area of society. As a matter of fact, Jesus said exactly the opposite. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Salt is worthless unless you put it upon that which you want to preserve. That's out there in the marketplace. Jesus also said, you're the light of the world. But let me tell you what many Christians do. They come to church with their little flashlights, pointing the lights on one another. Boy, are we great about criticizing one another, about gossiping about one another. But light is worthless unless you point it to darkness. That's out there in the marketplace. We better stop just playing church inside the four walls and take the church out there. There's a whole world dying out there. And guess what? We got the light. What are you doing with your light? Are you hiding it under a bushel? Are you one of those secret Christians that no one at your work knows you're a Christian because you're afraid that they'll know? Because you really are not walking like a Christian ought to walk? Or because you're afraid that you might be fired if they know you're a Christian? He said, no, 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 no. You put your light so everybody can see it. Now let me tell you this. You see, if you got the light and those people are in darkness, don't you think we got a responsibility to bring the light to them? We need to be salt and light in every area of society. In the media, in sports, in the arts, in education, in business, in government. Every area we got to be salt and light. But you see, we've been taught this garbage about separation church and state. Separation church and state. And let me tell you how this has deteriorated. 1962, prayer was removed from every public school. Is there anybody here old enough to remember when we prayed in school? You know, that became illegal after 1962. Now, some teachers continued to do it, but it was illegal after 1962. A year later, the Bible was removed from all public schools. Now, let me give you another tidbit of history that you may not know. Do you know who printed the first Bible in America? Congress. The first Bible in America was printed under the auspices of Congress. Do you know why? To be the principal textbook in every primary school, high school, and university. And it was so for over 150 years. Now, I'm sure many of you didn't know that because that has been erased from our history books. The Bible was the principal textbook in all our schools and state to me. But in 1963, as a matter of fact, if you read that decision from the Supreme Court, Pastor Harold, you know what it said? It said that as a child read the Bible without an adult interpreting it for them, they could become mentally insane. That was in their, in their decision. Look it up. Oh, it could cause mental, permanent mental damage for a child to read the Bible. And they banned the Bible. But let me tell you the sad thing about it. In spite of those two abominable decisions, the church remains silent. Their excuse is a political issue. Let me ask you, 
How can you call prayer a political issue? You think prayer is a political issue? How can you call Bible study a political issue? But you know something? That's exactly what the church did. That's exactly what the pastors did. You know the consequence of that silence? Teen pregnancy skyrocketed. And so did violent crime. What would have happened if every school, if every church said, no, we will continue to teach the Bible? You think they could have put a couple of hundred thousand teachers in jail and every pastor across America in jail? You know something? I know the Constitution very well. As far as I read Article 3 of the Constitution, the judges don't have the authority to make law. But you see, we just take it as a law. It's not a law. It's not the law of the land. All they can render is opinions. Opinions. Ten years later, that same Supreme Court decided that a baby in the womb did not have that unalienable right to life from our Creator, as stated in the Declaration of Independence. And they legalize abortion. Again, the church remains silent. Same excuse. It's a political issue. You know the consequence? Over 60 million babies have been murdered in America through abortion. Over a million a year are still killed in America through abortion. Let me tell you, we as the church of Jesus Christ need to fall on our faces in corporate repentance for the sin of abortion. The two great sins of America are abortion and slavery. And we need to be on our faces asking for God's Repentance, or our repentance. God help us. But it doesn't stop there. June 26, 2015. The Supreme Court said that God got it wrong. When God said in Genesis 1.27, Let us create man in our own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. And then in chapter 2 it says, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cling to his own wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It is Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. But you know, the Supreme Court basically said, no, 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 no. Marriage could be anything you want it to be. It could be two men and a horse. And by the way, I'm not extrapolating. <laughs> Do you know that in England, a woman married her dog? That only happened three or four years ago. I mean, it's crazy. And then beyond that, we have seen in the last few years what are called soji ordinances. S-O-G-I, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Ordinances. Those are the ordinances and say, if you feel like a woman today, you should have the right to walk into the women's bathroom. But you see, we need to understand that this is not about transgender rights. This is about the safety and protection of our wives, our daughters, and our mothers. This is about protecting them from that sexual deviant that is going to get into that women's bathroom to assault somebody. Now, do you remember? It was a movie, and I can't remember who it was that said, I am mad as I can be, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Well, when are we going to get to the point that we say, I'm not going to take it anymore? We got to stand. 
and stand firm. Because I'll tell you what, the enemy is alive and well. For praise God, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. You see, there was a pastor in the Second Great Awakening. His name was Reverend Charles Finney. Charles Finney is addressing a group of pastors. And I'm just going to tell you the end of this discourse with the pastor. He said, if Satan rules the halls of legislation, is that happening today? I think it's happening in Sacramento. I think it's happening in Washington too. If Satan rules the halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. And then he said, if our politic has be so, become so corrupt that the very foundations of our nation are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. And you ask yourself, well, why is he blaming the pastors? Why doesn't he blame the politicians? And by the way, let me just say something before I go any further. We all have a pulpit. Your pulpit may be the place where you work. Your pulpit may be the school where you're studying. Your pulpit may be your extended family. We all have a pulpit. So don't go, oh, you do it. No, no, do you know every time you do that, there are three fingers pointing at you? We all have a pulpit. Now, the pastor bears greater responsibility because to whom much is given, much is required. But why is Finney blaming the pastors instead of blaming the politicians? The next statement tells you. He says, dear brethren, I want you to be aware of this truth. That we are responsible for the morals of this nation. You know, the biggest lie that we have swallowed is something that I am sure all of you have heard. Politics cannot legislate morality. You heard that? Politics cannot legislate morality. That's a lie. Politics legislates morality all the time. You don't think Sacramento is legislating morality every day? What do you think it was when they legislated prayer out of school? When they legislated the Bible out of school? When they legislated abortion on demand? When they legislated same-sex marriage? Is that not legislating morality. The question is, whose morality are they going to legislate? Proverbs 29.2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked bear its rule, people mourn. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, people mourn. If the righteous, the people that abide by the Judeo-Christian principles of the Word of God, which, and those are the principles that have made America the greatest country on the face of the earth. If the people who are following those principles are not voting, are not even running for office, what is left? The wicked electing the wicked, and it becomes our fault. You know something that is really sad? Recent statistics shows that 50% of Christians in America are not even registered to vote. And of the ones that are registered to vote, 50% are not voting. It's our fault. It's our fault. You know, let me just share something with you. Did you know that the Bible tells you exactly who to vote for? The Bible tells you exactly who to vote for. Let me put it in context. Moses has just crossed the Red Sea. And now Moses is in the wilderness trying to govern 
about 2 million people. The Bible says 600,000 men plus women and children. So at least 2 million people. And Moses is going bananas. Here comes Jethro, his father-in-law. And in Exodus chapter 18, Jethro says to Moses, Moses, what you're doing is not good. And in Exodus 18, 21, God speaks to Moses through Jethro. And God says, you select from among the people. Now that word select in the Hebrew is the same word for elect. You select from among the people. And then God gives four qualifications. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. I'm going to repeat it for this side. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Let's take him one at a time. Able men and women, of course. What does that mean? That means elect men and women who are capable of doing the job. I can think of several. I mean, there's, there's a, a woman in the Northeast that she doesn't even, apparently even know how to spell her name. And she's in government. I mean, and every time she opens her mouth, these open mouths change foot. <laughs> so let's elect people that are capable of doing the job. Number two, such as fear God. Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, let me tell you this knowledge you can acquire. By reading books. Not such with wisdom. Wisdom is a divine attribute. It comes from God. Wisdom is revealed knowledge. It comes from God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We need to elect men and women that are governed by the principles of this book. These are the principles that have made America the greatest country on the face of the earth. And our constitution, our declaration, and all our laws proceeded out of this book. As a matter of fact, I want to give you a couple of more tidbits. Why do you think we have three branches of government? Isaiah 33, 22. Isaiah 33, 10, 22 say, says, I am your judge. That's the judicial branch. I'm your lawgiver. That's the legislative branch. I am your king. That's the executive branch. That's why we have three branches of government. Let me give you another one. Why are churches tax exempt? Do you think that comes from the IRS? No. It comes from... It comes from Ezra 7.24. Ezra 7.24, which says that, uh, that priests, Levites, workers, uh, and even uh, worshipers are all exempt from taxes and excise. Comes right out of the Word of God. Do you know something? The majority of pastors don't know that. Look it up. Ezra 7.24. Matter of fact, Pastor, why don't you read Ezra 7.24 for the whole congregation? And it'll blow your mind. <laughs> Ezra 7.24. I got it marked over there. Because <laughs> I, I, I think the, the people need to know that. And we certify to you that touching any of the priests, Levites, singers, porter, Nethodims, or ministers of the house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. Right out of the word of God. That's why churches are tax exempt. It doesn't come from the IRS. The IRS doesn't have the jurisdiction. By the word of God, you're tax exempt. You see, we just don't know the word. But you see, this country was built 
on the word. Everything we do is because of the word. But we're getting further and further and further and further away from the word. Let me say, tell you, okay, so able men, such as fear God, number three, men of truth. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have come across a candidate for public office that will tell you all these wonderful things they're going to do only to get elected and do exactly the opposite? Can I see your hands? Oh, just about everybody. <laughs> But you know something? You know why that happens? Because they want to tickle your ears. They're going to tell you what they think you want to hear. But you know something? That one is easy to fix. Jesus told us how to fix that one. Jesus said, Ye shall know them by their fruits. You know something? It's about the time we do some fruit checking. <laughs> do some fruit checking. Yes, yes. Don't tell me. Yes. Show me. <laughs> Show me the scars. When have you fought to protect the sanctity of life? Yes. When have you fought yes. to protect the sanctity of the traditional family? <laughs> When have you fought to make sure I keep more money in my pocket instead of the government stealing it out of my paycheck. Show me, don't tell me. We need to do some fruit checking. And number four, hating covetousness. Covetousness is greed. But you know something very interesting? Covetousness, yes, it is about money, but not principally. Covetousness in government is primarily about power and control. These politicians covet power and they covet the control that gives them over with the people. Now you know how to vet every candidate. Four qualifications. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, Hating covetousness. Mark, Exodus 15, 20, 18, 21. That's how you vet every candidate. And I'll tell you what, there are a lot that don't pass the muster. You know what, right, Pastor Harold? Unfortunately, too many don't pass the muster. So, you know, let me give you another tidbit. If you read to First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you find something that has a 100% correlation. Every time Israel or Judah had a righteous king, the whole country followed the Lord. There was peace, there was prosperity, there was harmony. Every time Israel or Judah had a wicked king, the whole country went to idolatry. There was wars, famine, chaos, 100% correlation. As the king went, so went the people. As the government official went, so went the people. You see the importance for us to elect righteous leaders? I mean, I know we got a big hurdle in Sacramento. But we can't give up. I mean, we got a big hurdle in Washington, D.C. But we can't give up. You know, my life verse has become Proverbs uh, 24, 16. Proverbs 24, 16. The righteous may fall seven times and gets up again. The righteous may fall seven times and gets up again. You know something? All of us are going to stumble and fall. But when you're down there on the floor, you got two options. You can stay down there feeling sorry for yourself or you can wipe your bloody nose and get up with twice the determination and keep moving forward. I don't know about you, but I choose the second one. You are not defeated until you stay down there. We have a responsibility to be light and salt. 
I'll tell you, in spite of all the challenges we have in Sacramento, in spite of all the challenges we have in Washington, this is still the greatest nation on the face of the earth. You know, I remember when, you know, I came from Cuba. And I, you remember the, the rafts coming from Cuba? You don't see any rafts going from here to Cuba. <laughs> you know, we're talking about, about the border. They're all coming this way. You don't see anybody trying to run that way. There's a reason for that. This is the greatest country on the face of the earth. It's about time we celebrate this country. I mean, I, I tell you what, I'm so grateful to God that I'm an American. I'm so proud to be an American. I love this country for like a passion. And I'll tell you what, those people that, that just hate this country, I'd love to have the money to buy them a one-way ticket. <laughs> We need to stand together. Yes. I'll tell you. Praise God. You know something? I read the back of the book. And we win. Hallelujah. We win. So I'll tell you. It's not time to become somber and be defeated. No, 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 no. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we need to stand in that. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. I'll tell you. We need to be encouraged. Galatians 6.2 Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need to encourage one another. We need to encourage one another and say, I'll pray for you. You pray for me. We need to encourage one another because... I'll tell you what, it, we are each other's keepers. And so we need to encourage one another and pray for one another because we need to preserve what we have for our children and our children's children. Amen. Now that means we can stay mum. We cannot stay silent. Proverbs 17, 15 says, he who justifies the wicked or he that condemns the just, both of them are an abomination to the Lord. You can't stay silent. Let me talk to you about two pastors in Nazi Germany. The first one was called Martin Niemüller. Pastor Martin E. Mueller was a Lutheran pastor like most of the pastors in Germany. You know, the Lutheran denomination controlled Germany. And they, were all, they all would dress on with black clothes with a pastoral collar. Pastor E. Mueller once said, first they came for the socialist. And I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Finally, they came for me. And there was no one left to speak on my behalf. Pastor Niemüller was arrested, was thrown into a jail cell with a bunch of drunks. The next morning, a Lutheran chaplain dressed just like Niemüller walks into that jail and sees this guy in this cell dressed just like him. And he says, brother, why are you in there? Niemüller stands up and says, my dear brother, considering what's happening in our nation today, why are you not in here with me? Let me tell you about another pastor. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. And then he said something pretty heavy. God will not 
hold us guiltless. God will not hold us guiltless. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. You know, our silence speaks very, very loudly. You know what the churches in Germany did when the trains were going by with those that were going to be executed? They played their music louder so they wouldn't hear the cries of those that were going to be killed. God help us. God help us. We got to stand in the gap. You know, in the book of Ezekiel, you find a very sobering scripture. God says, I look for one man. I look for one man that would stand in the gap that I may withhold judgment and could not find him. What an indictment. Well, you know something? There are much more than one here, men and women. We need to stand in the gap. We got to stop being part of the problem and we got to become part of the solution. We got to say, like the prophet Isaiah, hear my Lord, send me. Hear my Lord, use me. Look at those framers that gave it all and said, you know, we just commit everything. Our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. America is worth saving. Because you know what? I want my children and grandchildren to inherit a better America than I have enjoyed. And that cannot happen if each and every one of us does not stand firm as soldiers of the cross. Well, let me tell you something. We fight from a position of victory. The battle is already won. Jesus already won the battle. But you know what? We got to take the whole armor of God. And like 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We fight from a position of victory. In Luke chapter 19, he says, occupy till I come. Occupy is a military term. You don't occupy the valley, you occupy the hill. You occupy from a position of victory. Satan is a defeated foe. You do not need to fear Satan because Satan is afraid of you. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free. And do not entangle yourselves again with the yoke of bondage. That's Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. We can't allow the bondage that we have been put on by corrupt politicians to stand you know, I want to go very quickly through the Declaration of Independence and then I'll close. Second paragraph of the preamble. We hold this truth to be self-evident. That means anybody ought to get it. It ain't difficult. It's pretty clear. That we are, that all men are created equal. Now, unfortunately, some think they're more equal than others. That they are endowed not by government, but by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The only thing makes those rights unalienable is if they come from God. Because if they come from government, guess what? Government can take them away. And that's what they're doing in Sacramento and in Washington. They're taking them away. Among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And they are giving in order of importance. 
Life is the most important of all. And it's obvious. If you don't have life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness don't mean anything. You're dead. So life is the most important. That means that life from conception to natural death is an unalienable right from God. But let me tell you something else. If we have an unalienable right to life, we also have an unalienable right to protect our life and protect the life of our loved ones. That means the Second Amendment of the Constitution is intrinsic in that unalienable right to life. That's why the Second Amendment right is so important. Again, George Santillana once said, if we fail to learn the lessons of history, we are doomed to repeat them. Every tin horn dictator that has taken the guns from the population have then used the guns against the population. That's why we need to protect the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. That's what keeps us safe. That's what keeps us safe. Life, liberty. Second most important is liberty. Freedom. Freedom. Too many men died and women to give us our freedom. Men and women around the world in our armed forces are putting their lives at harm's, at arms, harm to protect our freedom. And then the last one, the pursuit of happiness. In spite of what some politicians have tried to tell you, happiness is not a right. Happiness is not a right. The pursuit of happiness. You got to work to get there. There ain't no free lunch. And you know what it takes? Hard work and perseverance. But you know the greatness of America is that with hard work and perseverance, anyone can achieve their dreams. Anyone can achieve. Let me give you an example. Frederick Douglass, runaway slave. He had nothing. Frederick Douglass went all the way to Washington, D.C., Frederick Douglass became the right hand to President Lincoln. Frederick Douglass was the most influential person outside of Lincoln to end slavery in America. Frederick Douglass was such a prolific writer. Let me tell you, tell you something that will blow your mind. When Frederick Douglass died, he had over $300,000 in the bank. That was 150 years ago. How many millions of dollars is that today? Frederick Douglass was a multi-millionaire and he started as a runaway slave. What's my excuse? What's your excuse? I mean, we like to sit in our little corner and say, oh, poor me. Oh, poor me. I can never make it. I'm so... I'm, I'm so discriminated. You know something? When I was about to leave college, I had a real thick accent. And I was told, you're going to be discriminated against. And he said, I said, yeah, but you know something? That doesn't bother me any. If I'm going to be discriminated again and I am competing for a job, I am to have to be so much better than that other guy that there ain't no choice. Unless that guy is dumb, I'm the only choice. And you know what? That has served me well all my life. Amen. You know something that is still true? Cream always rises to the top. If you excel, if you practice Colossians 3.17 and Colossians 3.23... And you do everything with excellence as unto the Lord. Those around you will recognize it. Your bosses will recognize it. And you will rise. 
But we have to do it as unto the Lord and for his glory. You know, God is faithful. When you exalt him, you know something? He will exalt you for his glory, not for your spreading out your wings and your feathers like a peacock, but to exalt him. I'll tell you, let's continue on the declaration. Certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Next sentence, that to protect those rights, governments are instituted. The whole purpose of government is to protect your unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, the government is involved in a lot of other stuff that they're not supposed to be involved. That's the whole purpose of government, to protect those unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Next paragraph. Next sentence. When governments cease to fulfill those needs, what needs? To protect your rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is our right. It is our duty to remove that government and replace it with another government. How do we do that? Through the ballot box. This is why each and every one of us need to be registered to vote and need to be voting for righteous leaders. Maybe there are some here that need to be running for public office and make sure that righteousness prevails. <coughs> Because, and I'm going to repeat again Galatians 5.1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free. And do not entangle yourselves again with the yoke of bondage. We need to break off that bondage that government has put us in by electing righteous leaders. But you know that is not the context of that scripture. In the context of that scripture, you know, God is a holy God. God is a perfect God. And we can never achieve that perfection or that holiness for God to be able to commune with us. So the righteousness of God, the holiness of God would demand that we be eternally separated from God because holiness cannot have communion with unrighteousness. But on the other hand, God loves us so much, so very much, that his greatest longing is intimate, eternal communion of us with him. So you could say that God found himself in a dilemma. On the one hand, his holiness demands that we be separated from him. On the other hand, his love is longing for that intimate communion with him. And God solved that dilemma by becoming a man. And God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ who walked a sinless life. And just like if you were in a court of law and you are accused of murder and the judge says guilty and the penalty is death. And you know you're guilty, but all of a sudden someone says, a moment, Your Honor. I'll die instead of that man. See, that's what Jesus did. Jesus, sinless Jesus, went to the cross and took your sins and your sins and your sins and your sins and my sins upon himself. The Bible says he literally became sin. And the wrath of God was poured upon sin. Taking the penalty, taking the judgment, taking the punishment for all of our sins. And Jesus went to death, the grave, and hell. To pay for your sins 
and my sins. And the proof that the payment was enough was that God the Father raised him up on the third day. And because of that, he could say at that cross, it is finished. I've done it all. Let me tell you, every eye closed, please. And I'm not going to ask you whether you are a member of a church. You could be a member of a church for 20 years. That doesn't save you. You could be part of a Christian family. That doesn't save you either. But you know, Jesus Christ provides for you and for me a free gift. He already paid all the penalty you and I deserve. And he's offering you a free gift. He says, I've already paid for you. I offer you my forgiveness. I offer you my salvation. I offer you not only the promise of everlasting life with me in heaven. But I also tell you that you will never have to walk alone again. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. As a matter of fact, I will take residence in you. And Jesus Christ will literally walk with you. And the first thing that you will experience as a result of that is a peace that surpasses all understanding. The peace of being reconciled to God. You don't have to deserve it. None of us can deserve it. It is a free gift. All you have to do is receive it for yourself. And God says when you do that, you're translated to the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of his dear son. If you would like to receive that free gift, not only of a promise of life eternal in his presence, but having God walking with you and guiding every step of your life from now and forever. I want you to lift your hand. Every hand, every eye is closed. I want to pray for you. Please lift your hand. Thank you. Any, anybody else? Please lift your hand. I want to pray for you. Should I call them forward? Okay. I would like to ask those people who raise their hands to please come forward. I'm going to ask Pastor Harold to pray for you. Please get off your seats and come forward and let Pastor Harold pray for you. Anybody else? Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you want to receive this gift of eternal life. This gift of Jesus Christ being in your life and never leaving you, never forsaking you. I want to ask you to get off your seats, come forward and let the pastor pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, let's all pray together. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I do believe. I do believe. That you are the Messiah. That you are the Messiah. I do believe. I do believe. That you died upon the cross. That you died upon the cross. To pay the price for my sin. To pay the price for my sin. And I ask you into my heart. And I ask you into my heart. To be my Lord and Savior. To be my Lord and Savior. To forgive me of my sin. To forgive me of my sin. And I thank you for the gift. And I thank you for the gift. Of everlasting life. Of everlasting In life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a hand. And Let's all stand. I love the testimony of Pastor Raphael. He was in prison in Cuba being tortured. He ended up being able to come to America. And at 36 years old, he gave his heart to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, they raised his family in the ways of the Lord. And today, Senator Ted Cruz is one of the closest confidants to the President of the United States of America. 
He meets with him. He's with him just yesterday at the border down in Texas. But he meets with him on a, on a regular basis in the White House. And is it not awesome that God has raised up Pastor Raphael to travel the country to share the true, real American history? And my friends, we got to realize something. There is a war for the soul of our country. And history has been rewritten. For the history that I was taught as a, a child is not being taught in the schools today. And my friends, we got to understand, just as he said, if we don't learn from history, we'll be destined to repeat history. So let's never take for granted the freedom that we have, the voice that God has given us, and we can never be afraid to stand up for what is true and righteous. And we can never be afraid to say, this is what the Word of God declares is right, and this is what the Word of God declares is wrong. And by doing that, it is never a message of hate. It is a message of love to rescue the perishing. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much for this night, and we pray for our great land. We pray for those in authority right now. And Lord, we thank you that you have raised up men and women in this country who do truly love you and have been willing to put themselves out there to be elected in different positions. And Lord, we pray that you would give them divine wisdom. And we pray for all of us, Lord, that we'd never be afraid to stand up for the truth because we can change this world that we live in by loving you and sharing your truth and rescuing the perishing and let them come to you. So, Lord, we pray for this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's thank Pastor Raphael. It's such an honor. And again, he poured into our kids today in CBI. And it's an awesome joy he'll be sharing in the next few days here in Southern California. Uh, if you'd like to come up and find out where he's going to be, if you have friends in other areas, uh, you're welcome to do that. God bless you and have a great night. Let's close in a word. Of